Sierra Leone, a proud but troubled nation. The Republic of Sierra Leone, a small West African nation, has a short but tumultuous and fascinating political, economic, and social history. From the time the first settlers lived on her lands, Sierra Leone has seen much instability and violence, as well as promising hope for its future. The land that is now the Republic of Sierra Leone has been proven to have been inhabited by humans for at least 2,500 years by archaeological evidence. Populated initially by other African peoples migrating from other parts of the continent. By AD 1000, the earliest tribes in the area began to practice agriculture and were sustaining themselves by farming. Toward the end of the 15th century, more and more European ships began visiting the Freetown estuary trading and sometimes even settling down with the natives. The three town estuary was and continues to be a great asset to Sierra Leone as it was one of the few good harbours on the west of Africa and the third largest natural harbour in the world. Therefore from early on Sierra Leone was right for trade and economic activity. When Europeans first arrived on the shores of Sierra Leone slavery was not a part of the local culture very quickly, however, the Europeans began to barter with local leaders to acquire natives to be taken away on their ships to be put to work as slaves, sometimes peacefully with offerings of European goods, and sometimes forcefully with violence. This didn't go on for too long before African chiefs caught on to the fact that enslaving their people afforded them great economic opportunity. People could either be sold to European slave traders or used locally to advance agriculture. Once this idea permeated the elites of Africa, like a wildfire, domestic slavery spread not only across Sierra Leone, but also across the African continent. By the end of the 18th century, slave trading chiefs with large stocks of their own enslaved people were a common sight along the West African coast. Although these enslaved peoples were slaves by definition, they were treated much better by their African masters, often even considered a part of the family than they would have been by European or American masters working on a plantation. From the late 15th century to the mid 19th century, the exportation of slaves remained a major business in Sierra Leone, and although the British criminalized the slave trade early on in the 19th century, slave trading continued illegally for decades. Early in the 16th century, a warrior people living in the north of Sierra Leone, called the Maine, decided to migrate south along the African coast, eager for new lands to conquer. By the time they arrived in Sierra Leone, they had amassed a powerful army and they had ruled Sierra Leone for the next 20 years. These two decades of invasion greatly affected the demography and political structure of the area. In Sierra Leone today, two major racial groups exist. The people of the present day Mende tribe, one of the largest tribes in Sierra Leone, are direct descendants of the main conquerors, while the second largest tribe, the Temne, are not. The main invasions mark the historical beginning of Sierra Leone as a violent area as the Maine brought with them weaponry, military prowess and a thirst for war. The Maine also instituted a poli political system in which each village and the surrounding area would be led by a chief. Many alliances followed chiefs and a sense of togetherness was brought about through cultural parallels. During the 17th century, a new tribe was beginning to rise up in Sierra Leone, today known as the Temne. By 1690, the Temne had migrated seaward toward what is now Freetown, and a significant number of kings in Sierra Leone were Temne, bringing rise to political power for the tribe. Islam was also permeating Sierra Leone during the 17th century, as the Muslim Fula people from east of Sierra Leone, particularly Senegal and Niger, moved into present-day Sierra Leone. The migration of the Fula people spurned many more Islam movements into Sierra Leone, and today, 60% of Sierra Leoneans are Muslims. In 1791, British Lieutenant John Clarkson assembled a group of former American slaves, originally from Africa but living in Nova Scotia, to travel to Sierra Leone and begin a new settlement. The colony they built eventually became modern-day Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. For a time, the settlers of Freetown stayed independent of the surrounding Mende and Temne tribes, but in the 1800s they gradually began working together in a trade and military context. The British colonizers of Freetown kept firm control over all dealings, however, often using violence against native peoples when they did not conform to their desires. 
In 1896, Sierra Leone was declared a British protectorate, meaning the British could control and govern it as long as the people agreed to be governed. The people did not agree, however, namely the chiefs, and widespread resistance and violence ensued, particularly in opposition to a large British tax on every household in the protectorate. This conflict became known as the Hutt Tax War of 1898. It wasn't much of a war, however, as the British easily kept control in the region despite the violence. After the Hutt Tax War, there was no more military resistance to British control. The only resistance to control came in the form of organized requests for more political rights, but as far as violence goes, the region stayed relatively peaceful for the next half century. During this time, many political freedoms were awarded to the people, and in 1951 a constitution was drafted, putting into motion the wheels of decolonization and independence. In 1960, Sierra Leonean leaders held a conference with Queen Elizabeth and other high-ranking British officials in hopes of negotiating independence for Sierra Leone. Britain agreed to give Sierra Leone its independence on April 27, 1961. On that day, just as planned, Sierra Leone became an independent country and Sir, M Sir Milton Magai became the country's first Prime Minister, with the country retaining its system of parliamentary government. In 1962, Sierra Leone held its first general election, with Sir Milton Magai being re-elected as a Prime Minister by a landslide. Sir Milton would become a beloved leader with his fair policies and intelligent use of the country's mineral resources to build wealth. His rule was short-lived, however, as he passed away in 1964 in Freetown, leaving his half-brother, Albert Magai, to be appointed by Parliament as the new Prime Minister. Albert would unfortunately not prove as, as effective a leader as his late brother. As soon as Albert got into power, he immediately fired many high-ranking government officials, seeing them as a threat to his power. Albert also increasingly took measures toward establishing a single-party state, and in 1967, rioting broke out in Freetown against his administration. Before Albert could perpetuate himself into power, however, he ran out of time and in 1967 a general election was held and APC party leader Siaka Stevens was sworn in as Prime Minister on April 26, 1968. Early in Stevens' administration, Stevens worked to close the gaps between Freetown and the surrounding provinces, building many new roads and hospitals. Although he seemed to be doing a decent job in office, there were several coup attempts on his government, and these threats led to Stevens becoming increasingly authoritarian and corrupt to hold on to his power. This change in Stevens' nature eventually led to a mutiny in Freetown by a group of his own soldiers. Several soldiers were arrested and imprisoned as a result. In 1971, Sierra Leone adopted a new Republican constitution, naming Stevens as president. However, many questions were raised about the legitimacy of Stevens' win by his opposing party, the SLPP, and in 1973, the SLPP boycotted the general election, leaving Stevens' party, the APC, with an overwhelming majority in Parliament. Stevens was re-elected again without opposition in 1976, and in 1978, the APC, facing no opposition from any other political parties, adopted yet another new constitution making the APC the only political party in Sierra Leone. Stevens remained in power until his retirement in 1985 after 18 years of rule. Joseph Seydou Momo was appointed his successor. Optimism was high across Sierra Leone as Momo took control, but Momo did not take any action to get rid of corruption as he said he would. Despite declaring a war against corruption, Momo was quick to arrest or fire any government officials he thought were planning to overthrow him. In 1990, Momo approved yet another new constitution for Sierra Leone, re-establishing a multi-party system, mostly due to pressure from other African nations. Despite new corrupt constitution, the APC contained, continued to be corrupt and retained power. By 1990, Joseph Momo's administration had left Sierra Leone in shambles. Momo had allowed rampant corruption in his government and had led Sierra Leone into a complete economic collapse. However, the worst came when the government could no longer afford to pay teachers and the country's education system imploded. With the collapse of education came the mass emigration of Sierra Leone's wealthy and educated class, and by 1991, Sierra Leone was ranked as one of the poorest countries in the world, despite being rich with natural resources. In 1991, it was becoming clear that Sierra Leone needed drastic change. Seeing an opportunity for an overthrow of the government, 
a man named Fode Sanko, along with numerous allies, formed a group known as the Revolutionary United Front, or RUF. The RUF had no problem gaining popularity among a Sierra Leone populace frustrated with their current government. The RUF made no promises about what type of government they would institute once in power, nor did they make any specific political promises to the people. They simply fed off the frustrations of the people. Recruitment of soldiers proved easy for the RUF, as tens of thousands of refugees from the Liberian Civil War had fled to Sierra Leone, most of whom were more than willing to fight a corrupt government. Within a month of entering Sierra Leone, the RUF controlled much of eastern Sierra Leone, having faced minimal resistance from the country's crippled government. With control of eastern Sierra Leone came control of the diamond mining area in Kono. This area would prove key for the RUF, as revenues from the illicit movement of these diamonds would fund their conflict for the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years, a period spanning from 1991 to 2001, the RUF would be, become not famous for revolution, but instead infamous for mindless cruelty. Over the life of the RUF, it is estimated that 10,000 children as young as 5 and as old as 12 were used as soldiers by the RUF. Attracted to the RUF by promises of food and shelter, the children were trained to perform unspeakable atrocities, including killing mass amounts of people and often under the influence of cocaine, giving them to make them as crazy and ruthless. Often, when the RUF would capture government soldiers, they would cut off their hands saying, you don't hold your weapon against your brother. The election slogan in Sierra Leone in the 90s was that people had power in their hands, so the RUF cut off the hands of most people captured in the pillage of towns and villages to prevent voting. The only captives lucky enough to keep their hands were those deemed fit for work in the diamond fields. These atrocities continued for 10 years, and the conflict came to be known as the Sierra Leone Civil War. In 1999, the United Nations sent a peacekeeping force to Sierra Leone to disarm the rebels, and by 2001, the rebels had been disarmed and the conflict was effectively over. By the end of the war, it was clear that the RUF was never interested in governing Sierra Leone, but only in power, money, and violence. Even though the RUF never rose to power, it is estimated that the war needlessly cost the lives of 50,000 people. In 2004, Parliament passed the Local Government Act of 2004, which brought local government councils back to Sierra Leone after 30 years, and in August 2006, it was announced that an election would be held on July 28, 2007. In that election, Ernest Karoma, the APC's candidate, was elected and sworn in the same day. Having ran on promises to fight corruption and manage the country's resource more effectively, as of two fa August 2012, Koromo is enjoying a seemingly effective presidency, respected by people, having promised to push a zero tolerance policy towards corruption. On November 17, 2012, Koromo will be up for re-election as president of Sierra Leone. His opposition will be Julius Mada, bio of the SLPP. The economy of present-day Sierra Leone is similar to that of any developing country in Africa. High debt caused by dependence on foreign aid has proven to be a massive weight on the country's shoulders. Although government spending only accounts for 4% of GDP as of 2007, Sierra Leone's debt-to-GDP ratio was 59.6% in 2011 and soared to 82.9% in 2012. Why such high debt? The answer is simple, gross mismanagement of the economy. As can be seen here, agriculture accounts for 58.6% of Sierra Leone's GDP, with two-thirds of the country's population working in that field. However, the government has chosen to build wealth by focusing on natural resources such as diamonds and gold, but mining and quarrying only account for 4.5% of GDP. With agriculture neglected, the economy of Sierra Leone isn't nearly as efficient as it could be, and the country has to rely on foreign aid to stay alive. Several other factors characterize Sierra Leone as a developing country in Africa. Sierra Leone's Human Development Index was a score of 0 0.336 in 2011, ranking it 180th among the world's countries. The Human Development Index is a composite statistic of life expectancy, education and income indices to rank countries into four tiers of human development. Sierra Leone is currently ranked as a low human development country. 
typical of a, of a country in its region. Sierra Leone's Gini coefficient is 62.9, meaning that Sierra Leone has a very high income inequality. This is evidenced by the fact that 70% of the population lives in poverty. Not relative poverty, but absolute poverty, where food, shelter, money and clothing are in very short supply and people cannot satisfy their basic human needs. A very small minority, just like many other African countries, bring in the vast majority of the country's income. All these numbers are not to say that the situation in Sierra Leone is too bleak, just not ideal. Despite many problems and inefficiencies, the country is, in fact, headed in the right direction, as evidenced by many promising economic and social trends. First, the economic trends. Since the end of the Sierra Leone Civil War in 2001, Sierra Leone's gross domestic product, determined by the purchasing power parity, has been steadily on the rise every year, with only the exception of 2007, as seen here. Gross domestic product per capita has also been on the rise every year in the same period, with the exception of 2007, as seen here. As of 2011, GDP per capita stood between 850 and 900 US dollars. These pictures of growth can be rather misleading, however, because an increasing nominal growth rate does not necessarily translate into an increasing real growth rate. As seen here, since 2000, Sierra Leone has enjoyed a real growth rate of about 5-7% to per year, but this figure does not show any signs of going up. This is likely due to the mismanagement of the economy as discussed earlier, leading to dependence on foreign aid and an inability to truly grow. Another explanation is high inflation in the country, which has risen since 2002 and peaked at 18% in 2011, as seen here. Several useful statistical trends also point to social progress in Sierra Leone. Since 2000, the birth rate in Sierra Leone has steadily fallen, as seen here, especially in 2009. This decline in the birth rate has contributed to a steady decline in the infant mortality rate. One can clearly see that birth rates and mortality rates have declined hand in hand in the past 10 years, and a great indicator of an improved standard of living in Sierra Leone. Not coincidentally, as birth rates and infant mortality rates have declined in Sierra Leone, life expectancy has increased in recent years, especially since 2009 as seen here. A lag in the effects of birth and infant mortality rates on life expectancy is to be expected, and life expectancy is likely to increase in the coming years as Sierra Leone continues to grow. The final statistic showing social progress in Sierra Leone is the literacy rate. Although still low in relation to the rest of the world, Sierra Leone has made vast investments in education following the Civil War. And since 2000, the literacy rate has been fast on the rise, as seen here, reaching a record high for the country in 2009, with 31% of the population being able to read and write. However, among children, these numbers are much better, as over half of children under the age of 15 are able to read and write in Sierra Leone. A promising statistic for the next generation of Sierra Leoneans. Although great progress has been made in Sierra Leone since the end of the country's civil war, major issues still confront them moving forward. When polled, most people in Sierra Leone say that the three issues that concern them most in the future are jobs, corruption, and development. All three must be addressed if Sierra Leone's future is to be one of happiness and prosperity for its people. Across the country, and in Freetown in particular, the unemployed congregate on street corners, shop houses, and marketplaces ready to work but without opportunity. The lack of investment in Sierra Leone ensures that jobs will not be created anytime soon, leaving millions of people in perpetual poverty. The jobs needed simply don't exist and won't until reinvestment is ramped up in the country. And with so many natural resources and the world's third largest natural harbour, it seems to make no sense the investment would not follow, but it does not. The reason for this is government corruption. Although Sierra Leone's government is the least corrupted it has been in the country's history, that's simply a relative statement. Resources are still mismanaged, as discussed earlier. Former Chief Justice of Sierra Leone, Desmond Luke, was quoted as saying, 
If you have been here for some time, you will know that anybody and everybody is stealing everything when asked about corruption in the government. He also said that shortly after the Civil War, Britain sent a $1.9 million aid package to Sierra Leone, which was all squandered on plasma televisions and hunting rifles by senior government officials. It is clear that if Sierra Leone is to have a brighter future than its past, large steps will have to be taken to weed out corruption and stealing in the government. Development is the last of the three major issues facing Sierra Leone moving well into the post-Civil War era. Eleven years into reconstruction after the Civil War, the road systems remain poor, with only one town connected to Freetown by a paved road. Schools and hospitals remain severely underfunded, and although both statistics are improving, illiteracy and infant mortality rates remain very high. Reliable power is also a large problem in Sierra Leone, making it difficult for businesses and families to thrive. An exciting plan to build a hydroelectric power plant for the country was approved over 15 years ago, and no progress has been made on its construction. Despite the difficult issues facing Sierra Leoneans moving forward, the people remain optimistic that with the right leader in place, the future is bright for their small but proud nation. If the right leader can be found who is truly willing to rid the government of corruption in the name of helping his or her people, and really has the well-being of their country in mind, the future could be a great one for Sierra Leone. With the right ideals in place, Sierra Leone absolutely has the potential to shed its label as a developing post-war country and don a new one as a peaceful, beautiful place of prosperity. As a popular Sierra Leonean saying goes, true patriots may be red, green, or orange, the colors of the major political parties on the outside, but all of us are green, white, and blue, the colors of the national flag on the inside. With the strong sense of national pride instilled in the hearts of the Sierra Leonean people and the right leader to guide them, Sierra Leone will without doubt someday be a place its people can take pride in.